Thank you very much, Johannes, Mirza, and Kevin. I think all of you will agree with me that it is wonderful not to have PowerPoint presentations, but to have a conversation and a real discourse. I think you will also agree with me that uh, the three gentlemen were very honest and very much shared real issues that they are confronting and uh, give us a lot of I'm a vegetarian, I hate to say give us a lot of meat, <laughs> <laughs> but they do give us a lot to chew on and a lot to think and reflect. Let me open up for conversation, discussion, comments, questions, additions, etc. Um, as usual, raise your hand, there will be a mic coming your way, and I will collect a cluster. I will ask people, please tell us your name and institutions, and I start with the gentleman here in the front. And I notice one more hand, one, two, Three, four. I'll take about four or so at this time. Great. I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project, and I really appreciate this conversation. We're in this same struggle and have gone, we're in the seventh year of a scale-up process that we've been doing in Ghana. And uh, I appreciate particularly the comments about mindset shift. And there were two that we found were particularly surprising. We probably should have been surprised. In the staff that facilitate the process, in that a lot of creative boutique projects have behind them a CEO level person who's constantly innovative and creative in the process of managing the project. And then when it's scaled up, you're hiring people who are u living in a culture of leadership where they defer all decisions to the top. So we discovered it really took quite a bit of time to instill a more entrepreneurial style of leadership in more junior leaders, um, and that we had to have the patience and long-term commitment to develop that shift in kind of a leadership and management culture. And that was a, a particularly strong in rural development where there has been you know, centuries of kind of hierarchical obedience within bureaucracies. Thank you. Um, Adam, would you take to Yakumina in the fourth row? I'm Yakumina the Recht, and you took actually the words out of my mouth because I was going to say it's very wonderful that you identify staff incentives and, and the culture of moving every four years as a problem, but then how are you going to solve it? <laughs> because it takes such an enormous effort to change a management culture and to change the incentive system towards um, intrinsic rewards, seeing yourself as, a, as one of the actors that actually is facilitating a process of scaling up and getting your reward out of that for yourself, but also having your institution value you for doing it. And I'm very glad that you have a, a practical example because I certainly know that we never managed to do this in the World Bank. So I was hoping that you would both have some more ideas than just identifying the problem, if you have a chance to speak again. Thank you. Adam, there was another hand just about two rows behind. Okay. Um, Brian Bruns, I'm a consulting sociologist who works mostly on participation in irrigation and water management. And my question is about the role of adaptation and dealing with diversity in scaling up, or is it just a matter of replicating standard models? Thank you. Thank you. And there was a hand here. Uh, I'm Rajin Srista. Uh, I'm an independent consultant working in the agriculture road development sector for quite some time now at the policy and the program levels with various international donor agencies, including the World Bank, ADB, UN, and all that. Uh, I've been struggling with this for myself for quite some time. How to, and there are lots of, I mean, successful programs in the sector, especially in the context of the fragile economies, but the scaling up has been a major issue. My question to the panel is, uh, like I heard from Agha, gentlemen, I mean, there's a limit too, or there's no time limit on this, how rural development in general can be successful. So where do you draw a kind of a trade-off between the horizontal and the vertical scaling up part, especially in this context, when 
Secondly, I feel the institutional issue that's been raised very important and monitoring and evaluation, especially in the context of impact evaluation of a program has been highly neglected in most of our programs, either nationally or donor supported programs, where how do we you know, come up with a more effective pathway on that? So that's some of my questions, thank you. Shall I turn over to the panel at this point? I don't know how you want to begin, Johannes. Do you want to take the first? There were some let comments me, and some yeah, questions. Let me, let me try uh, and just leadership culture. I thought the point you made, I think, is, is a terrific contribution to sort of the experience that we're trying to collect. So if you have a story on this, if, you, if that's written up somewhere, how you did it, what you did, I think we need precisely those kind of stories, how it helped what created this uh, in your, you know, as you were dealing with this? What created your realization that this was a key constraint or opportunity? How did you go about actually doing it and how, what was the impact? So if we could get that story in a sense bottled, I think it would be very helpful because I think <coughs> that is indeed uh, a, a constraint that uh, one, one runs into is sort of what is the leadership culture and is it the short term the once or one off as in uh, after me the deluge or whatever or is it something where you actually get the young people excited about the longer term perspective and you get older the older leaders actually r realizing that they being flexible and adaptive which brings me to another point is raised is also just important um, in that context let me say one other issue which we didn't talk about today is risk averseness I think out of this project culture that we have, where projects basically are not allowed to fail because that reflects failure, comes a risk averseness, averseness that basically said we cannot really learn from our projects because whatever we do is we need to make sure we throw everything, best management, kitchen sink, whatever, at the project to make sure in the end we can say the project succeeded. Well, have we learned very much? Probably not because we haven't learned whether the models or the components that we are pursuing work in an average quality environment, which is we're scaling up after all will have to work. So one, I think the mindset issue, it has partly to do with leadership, but it also has to do with risk taking, and it has to do with accepting failure as an integral part of learning, at least for parts of your project, and not trying to do everything to make that particular project work, but sort of think about what do I need to learn so I can actually have a replicable model for the future. Staff continuity, I, you know, I've struggled with this, Kevin and I, and, and Mirza, and I, we haven't had much of a conversation on this. Look, the reality is we as individuals, every one of us, I think, or most of us, thrive on change. After five to seven years in a particular job, I will be stale, you will be stale, all of us will be stale. So we individually, it, you know, yeah, maybe you can keep a guy or a lady in a particular country, and on a program for 10, 15 years, in the case of Peru, which is the case study here, that actually happened and it worked very well. But in general, I don't think we can rely on keeping people in place for more than five to seven years. I think it's just not going to work. That's not, that's reality. So what as a manager do we have to do? We have to put in place much more effective knowledge management, handoff, uh, you know, getting into the overlapping as we do our appointments, what do we typically do? And I've seen it again, I've done it myself as a manager in the World Bank, but I see it now from the outside and it's disastrous. We move people out of a particular resident mission or, or office in, in place X, and the next person comes six months later. Now what is, how can you maintain continuity? How can you have an effective handoff? Now, yes, you've got some backups in place and so on, you've got local staff, but that's not the way, if you're really interested in scaling up, if that's your agenda, if that's your mindset, as a manager, you do it totally differently. So I think my, my advice to you at this stage of my career, since I'm no longer managing myself, is, you, you know, think about what are the processes, knowledge management, handoff, transfer, and so on, that you need to put in place. Not easy, I know, but ultimately that's, in keeping people for 15 years in place is not the answer. So. Um, adaptive, tr I think it's all about adaptation, somewhere back there, right, it's all about adaptation and this is where I actually worry a bit and this is the next point, I worry a bit about impact evaluation the way it's currently designed because the notion that you, that seems to be a bit too pervasive is that somehow if the model 
that I've put in place, whatever it is, uh, you know, works in place X and I've got a carefully designed impact evaluation control experiment it tells me that it works. And therefore, I replicate it elsewhere. Well, chances are the conditions, even in the next village or in the next uh, province for sure, in a different country especially, are likely to be different. So I really have to, as I do the evaluation or monitoring, I have to bring in other dimensions that, frankly, I'm not sure are, lend themselves to that controlled experiment approach, including the institutional dimension, the polit political dimension, cultural dimensions, or whatever. And I have to monitor those, I have to understand them, and I have to think about them explicitly as I monitor and evaluate. So this is tough, and as I think you said, Kevin, it is very tough. And we're, frankly, I'm only learning. I'm with IFAT, we're looking at monitoring evaluation. How would you do monitoring evaluation with a scaling up in a scaling up context? And it's different from doing it the way we've traditionally done it. I suspect it's different as you now get into impact evaluation with IFPRI, and we should have a conversation about that uh, in terms of your controlled experiment approach. Finally, in fragile states, we have a paper on fragile states, and I've had a bit of a tug, tug of war, now. I don't tussle with uh, Kevin on this. Uh, you know, fragile states, yes, it's scaling up is incredibly difficult. It's more difficult than in a great place where, you know, governments do it on their own, they have the right policies, they listen to what, uh, what the experts say and so on. But my view is that if if anything, a scaling up perspective, a stick with it perspective is even more important in, scale, in, in fragile states than it's in, in elsewhere. And if we believe we can help fragile states with sort of pinprick support, one-off, short, small, going from one to the other uh, intervention, I think we're making a terrible mistake. Because I think, if anything, they need more of a continuity, more of, uh, of a longer-term engagement and a longer-term vision and willingness to adapt as we move along the scaling up pathway. And we found actually in reviewing the evidence that scaling up in fragile states is possible, it happens, and we just, I think like elsewhere, we just need to focus on it, not just, we need to focus on it, it's tough. It's going to be harder than elsewhere, but I believe it's the only way to proceed. Thank you. Kevin, would you like to go next? Okay. Um, I can be brief because Johannes has brainwashed me so much that most of what he <laughs> says I've agreed with on this. On the incentive, which is really, it's perplexing, it really is one of these things that is, it bothers me because in managing a large number of people in a bureaucracy, the incentives for anything, it's not just scaling up, is a difficult issue. Um, and Johannes is right, the, the Peru case study, which you will read in there, which is the probably the best case of scaling up that IFAD has had in the Peruvian highlands is, uh, and it's no relation to the fact that my wife is Peruvian, incidentally. Uh, I have to tell you, because this happened way before I got there, was partly the result of having a country program manager, who is for us the person who manages our program, managing that program for 14 years while living in the country. And incidentally, he's still there. Uh, not living in the country, but he's about to retire in IFAD, and he's still working on Peru. And here is a man who is not at all interested in the common incentives, so it's an interesting case study, who's willing to take on authority. He sends me the nastiest emails that you can possibly imagine. When, so he's totally devo devoted to the business, not to his paycheck, not to his comfy, you know, diplomatic uh, plates that many of us are in the UN. He's totally devoted to getting this stuff done in Peru. And this is, unfortunately, you know, is a rarity. It isn't that the staff are not devoted. Most of them, they are. But they're not devoted to that extent. Johannes is quite right. The average devoted intelligence staff member is not going to stay living in the same place for 14 years. Um, so how do you create that kind of devo <laughs> devotion amongst the mere mortals of the world? We have tried everything. We've given, uh, uh, we've given Roberto uh, an award. So you start to advertise. The president gives him an award. This is the kind of behavior that we want. This is the kind of project outcome that we want, not just going to the board. You remember the old uh, Jacomina in the bank? What are the real rewards? How many projects have you taken to the board? That's the beginning of the process, not the end. Um, how many projects have you kept out of problem status? Well, that's good, but that's not scaling up. Uh, they, they could be projects that have no impact at all, but they're not in problem status. So we are rewarding the, the wrong things. So that's, that's one. Secondly, we now, in the 
review of projects, we actually ask each government and call them a task manager, to use the World Bank expression. We don't use that expression, but to have a scaling, what, what is the plan for scaling up if this project works? And as I said, in the country strategy, and we actually ask the question. I have a gadfly who works for me in IFA. This is Sheikh Sarong, who's worked with Johannes in this, and this is his job. It's to be a pain in the butt to every staff member. Where is the scaling up plan? And I can tell you, he often finds them deficient. So that's the second thing. And finally, what we haven't done is to eliminate some of the disincentives. For example, we still have a project review process that we call quality assurance that looks at all the nitty gritty. Is the procurement plan there? Is there the anti-corruption plan? Uh, the readiness for implementation? And what I see that pushing the staff to do is to simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, make it corruption proof, uh, absolutely ready. Well, it's easier to do something uh, that is ready for operation if it's small. Uh, scaling up is difficult to, to do, so simplify. So we still have to remove those, those disincentives. So Jekka I agree with your question is key, because uh, again, in a bureaucracy, that is what is happening. The staff are not on your side. Intellectually, they may be, but they're not behaving that way because their incentives are wrong. The gentleman asked about adaptation uh, or just replication. My, my sense is that it is both. Um, you, you cannot take the Peru, we've tried to take the Peru experience in our naivete to other countries. We've brought Malawians and Rwandans to Peru. We've sent Peruvians to uh, China, and this is great stuff. But the Peruvian experience is Peruvian experience. <laughs> it needs a huge amount of adaptation, even in Colombia next door, not to mention in, in another country. Well, one, part, one way of doing this is to, to break it down and look what works. And one of the things, if you read the Peru case study, is this thing called learning routes. Now this may be adaptable, easily adaptable to other countries, so they're components. And uh, what we have begin, uh, begun to talk about is thematic upscaling. That is to take these components of programs that look pretty successful and look like they would be more easily adaptable than the whole program. Adapting an Aga Khan project, which is a complex project, it's, it's an integrated project, to another country is difficult. But there may be pieces of it that are highly adaptable. So you, we're looking at thematic scaling up. Um, but replication is also, if, again, in the Peru case study, what started was a small r integrated rural development project. Think of it as that. That had some interesting elements to it, and it worked. And there was a, moni you know, a monitoring and evaluation system, rudimentary, that seemed to work. And that was s replicated geographically over a long period of time. Uh, and each replication refined it, so it became better. So that is a way that can work within a country, scaling up within a country. Finally, on the M&E, let me just tell you what we're doing. Uh, with IFPRI, as I said, the World Bank, USAID, Gates Foundation, a little bit of input from uh, FAO, and some more private partners, 3IE, uh, academics. We're looking at the methodology, because as I said, there are huge, me and as you said, there are huge methodological problems that have to be resolved. It's a partnership. In the past, we tended to do M&E right in the projects directly with government. We'd finance an M&E component that 60% of the time didn't work at all. Uh, so this is a partnership. A big, it's well-funded, so it's pretty rare in this business. We actually have some money for it. Um, and it's not just funding M&E and projects. So what we're doing is we're actually going to fund some of this analysis. We're going to actually apply these improved methodologies and pay for it outside of the projects with grants. We're doing baselines. In IFAD, we're actually paying for baseline surveys ourselves. You cannot expect governments that only have a modest amount of interest in this stuff to do it. They just don't do it. It doesn't work. We've, done some, we've paid for something like 70 baselines. We have an immense amount of data. What we don't have is staff that are capable of analyzing it. This is why we, we, we're interested in others. And building capacity while you do it. So you try to take your partners with you by involving them to the extent that they're interested. Some are very interested, some are not interested at all. Uh, and finally, having targets. Actually, what we're finding is having quantitative targets for outcomes and impacts are very useful. Not just output targets, but outcome. It clarifies the mind. What is it you're trying to get? 
in these places. So you measure it, you push the methodology, you build capacity. I don't know if that's going to work. But what we've done in the past certainly doesn't be stuck there. Marisa, any, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, a lot has been said, so I won't repeat much of it. I, all I would say is that in terms of, uh, rather like your Peruvian Roboto, uh, I can, the best of our rural development programs, Pakistan, Shoaib Sultan Khan, 14 years general manager. Aga Khan Rural Support Program, India, Anil Shah, 13 years. Uh, Mountain Society's Development Program, Tajikistan, Jodgo Faisov, 11 years. Pioneers who started those programs gave the direction. That's, the, that's our evidence. I won't talk about the poor programs and the way they are poor programs, two, three year stints of the leadership. So I think there is, I agree with Johannes. I don't think that the international um, career paths are such that allow people to stay for long stints, but the leadership has to be. I don't have a magic idea about what we need to do. I have a hypothesis. I think we are recruiting the wrong people. And I'm, again, at fault. I look for masters and PhDs and Western experience and all that sort of wonderful things. And an HR consultant has put a new thing in my head recently and said, are you picking the right people? Are you looking for the right things? Do I talk about character, commitment, loyalty? country experience. You know, we don't, where do we put the weights? So that's one sort of suggestion that we might think about. The other thing is, I think somebody was asking about the end game and is it vertical and is it horizontal? I think the big new thing for of, of all of us to grasp is going to be the private sector. At the Aga Khan Development Network, we've been talking to impact investors over the last 18 months. I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, have heard about it. It's such a refreshing conversation. Number one, bankers don't worry about 20-year programs. Oh, you want to do a power station? Of course it's going to take you 20 years to pay us back the money. Oh, you're going to do schools and health clinics around the power station? Oh, yeah, yeah, that would take 18, 20 years as well. Wow. Never had a conversation like that with the World Bank or my previous employer's DFID. Five-year programs. So watch out the private sector. Our own examples at the Aga Khan Network the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development is a for-profit part of a development network. It doesn't lament about scaling up very often, as we do. It's building the fourth power station in East Africa, generating progressively more megawatts. And they have never had a conversation in our meetings that we have a problem to scale up from a 15 megawatt to a 300 megawatt power station. What is it that they do? So I think we need to watch the pirate sector is going to encroach much more of our work, and I think rightly so, because they bring a certain different type of dis discipline for us. Um, on impact evaluation, the thing I would say is that those people who count the numbers must really value the counting of numbers. <laughs> if they don't, we won't get good results. And so for us, as Lo Johanna said, his Highness the Aga Khan has recently been asking us, where are the results? So we have been looking at the whole concept of what we are calling quality of life indicators. I'm very happy to share with people who want to see what we mean by that. It's a range of indicators, social and economic, uh, that actually have started to do baselines in these eight rural, development, rural areas I was talking about earlier. And we expect to then go through that through longitudinal studies every two years doing a baseline to see where people are uh, in terms of quality of life. I think that that is uh, quite path-breaking. We are lucky because His Highness the Aga Khan is prepared to fund it and to underwrite it. Uh, I think, one thing I haven't heard around the room yet, it is costly to do it well. And none of us can convince any donor agency to put 10 years down, money down for results an impact evaluation. And I think if there were the gods at uh, IFAD or UN who could do that, I think that's what needs to happen because uh, we have nearly persuaded His Highness the Aga Khan that that's what it will mean, that we'll have to do it over 10, 15 years uh, to be able to really genuinely show what we are doing. But I do think that um, it is again about people who are collecting the data better understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and want to do it. Otherwise, 
is same old stuff. Sorry. Thank you. Um, let me do one quick round of questions. Oh, my goodness. Because um, I do want us to end at 1.45 on time. Then whoever wants to stay on and continue interacting can do so if the speakers are still here. Um, and maybe this time I will allow the audience to spend more time and less time for our speakers. I had Suresh <laughs> up there. Um, I had Suresh up there. And may I ask the audience to be a little short in your comments or questions so we can take more of you? Suresh? Uh, thank you, Rajul. Uh, Suresh Babu from IFPRI. Um, very useful um, commentaries from all the speakers. But I thought the the focus has been on the international financial institutions, uh, not much on the governments, where there is also a lot of devotion for development. And how do we nurture that de uh, devotion and how do we put the foundation for scaling up uh, when we do three to four year projects? As someone who has been in a country for more than four years, I can tell you that all you can do in your period is to put the foundation and identify key players and then nurture them. And that requires constant interaction with the policymakers and the uh, key players. We all know that, but because of the project mode that we operate, we tend to forget that extra work we have to do into identify the key players there and, and bring them their credibility out so that they are recognized when we leave the country as the key players. That's something that we can do in all the projects. But also we talked about um, the scaling up. I wonder about what is the scale of scaling up? What do we really mean by scaling up? And when do we say we have scaled up? And <laughs> scaling up from the external donors and is a dream. And it has to be, like Kevin said, the successful uh, scaling up has been from the ownership of the governments. But that requires capacity. Capacity of the players and actors to take up both vertically as well as horizontally. At the same time, contextually scaling up. That is something that we are forgetting. We can contextually take one context and then apply it to the similar kind of context and quickly scale up in different places. That's something that we talked about. Also, organizational capacity to scale up. Why we cannot scale up with the governments? Because the capacity to do the kind of things that we do from external uh, forces and actors is not there with the, with the organizations. And even if we can spend about 20% of our resources and time in strengthening that capacity, we have a better chance of scaling up with the governments. That's the one way, only way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Adam, can you come up here? We'll start with this first row and walk backwards with Schengen and then the two ladies next to him. Schengen. All right. Uh, thank you, Rajo. And thank you, uh, um, Johannes, uh, Kevin, and Amira for such a great presentation. I read your brief, very great interest. So I have probably three brief comments. One is the private sector. So how can you really engage the private sector to scale up some of your successes? Uh, the second is the uh, fragile states. Uh, Johannes mentioned a little bit about this. The poverty, hunger are in these fragile states or countries in conflicts. Uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, now later in Iraq. So, I mean, how can we really define certain cr criteria when and how we would engage with these countries? Or should we just shy away from that because of security reason, because huge risk, maybe the potential government change? The third one is impact assessment. I very much agree with Kevin and Justin and uh, Johannes Lin's point on the, um, the, the importance of impact evaluation. Also, do not overplay that. So how do you define a success based on what? Based on impact assessment or based on otherwise, you know, what do you scale up? So it's not clear to me yet. You emphasize about a learning process. I very much agree, but it, you can learn from almost everything. So where can you start? Will you pass the, yeah. Hi, I'm Kate from MSI. I just want to say quickly, I appreciated the last comment from the other gentleman on defining scale, and MSI has been working on and is trying to pick up um, defining with people, what do you mean and how do you want to scale? Is it replication? Is it expansion? And, and defining that it is a critical issue. I had a couple of questions, but I'll keep it to one. Um, in terms of whose job it is to scale up, um, related to whose job it is to do impact evaluations long term, um, this is a challenge that I think a lot of us have run into. Um, but there's the people who do the projects and the innovation and the pilots. We all do that. But one of the big challenges to scaling up is whose job is it to scale up? It's not a clear thing. It's the government's job or, or some private sector person's job to take it on in the long run. But do we have a business model or some kind of characteristics of the kinds of agencies that could help facilitate scaling up? And what does that look like? 
Hi, I'm an intern from WFP. Um, I have um, I have two comments, kind of like a question and a commentary. Um, so I recently went to the um, Central Global Development to look at a um, documentary on how China met Africa. And then it was very interesting to see that there was a lot of farmers, actually, the Chinese farmers who go there to make a life there to help support the African development. And because their life is also tied to their success, they really work hard and they sometimes like acquire land so that their children also stay there and be more successful. So I was wondering, in terms of like staying and being there, I mean, they were very devoted when I saw it. So is there anything that the West or the, um, we can learn from the Chinese development? Are we behind them? Or are there, is there any examples that we've been looking at that are very successful? And my second question is, um, Mr. Lin, you said that you know um, a lot of times we're not risk taking, but we are more concerned of doing things right, and you know we want to make it complete, and we want to finish the project. But how do you actually balance those two? When you know when you have to you know make a project appraisal, you have to make it certain that it's going to go you know, and succeed, and and your boss will look at that. So <laughs> how could you, and especially in a world with you know um, like decreasing funding, and you know you need more results. How do you really balance those two? I would really um, love to hear how yeah we can take more risk um, and not be too you know baggy and like a you know a supply mode. <laughs> you know we want to be more savvy. So thank you. I am going to make myself terribly unpopular. I will just take three more questions and I will ask our speakers to give very short responses. I take the lady here and then Adam, please come up here. Uh, Ava development anthropologist. My questions are directed to Mirza Jahani. Uh, on this issue of, you know, governments are, the government's ability to absorb change, uh, I quite agree with you on the weak capacity business, but my experience is it's not only weak capacity, rather sheer unwillingness. And <laughs> in that context, and when you do have very good policies uh, in paper, how do you get these unwilling political powers that be to get them to act, one. The other two is, I also agree with on the sequencing of interventions. Um, my experience has been that, again, tying into uh, building capacity, and when you do identify economic drivers, you know, it's worth capacity and you tie it up with this economic activity. So at the end of the day, uh, these people that are being helped have something tangible at the end of the day to show off. Okay, that's two. The third one is I don't quite agree with you on you cannot find competent people to steer the tide. I think you just haven't looked far enough. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, will you give the mic here to? Thank you. Jeannie Harvey with USAID. Um, I really appreciate this conversation a lot. It's very helpful for me and um, some of the things we're talking about uh, at USAID. And I, and I have I actually really appreciate the other question about what is scaling up? What do we mean by scaling up? And one of the things that I've been wrestling with is that at USAID, I hear a lot of talk about scaling up, but I, I'm not exactly sure not only how we do it, but I think the fear is, or my fear is, does this become another sort of buzzword for something we say we're going to do, but we're really operating exactly the same as we always have operated? So. How do we ensure that you know we don't that we actually use the I I think the the roadmap that you've given us I think is a really good tool for us to use and so I just um, I hope we can we can actually use it in in the way and ask some of these same questions I think the questions about staff incentives are really important and you know kind of are we in the same model as we have always been but we're but now we're just saying we are going to scale up or we're calling it scaling up but. When in fact it really isn't, it's kind of the same model. Thank you. The Thank last you. question goes to Brian. And uh, I apologize again that I'm overlooking so many of you. Thanks, Ra. Well, Rajul, you're very popular with me, and I'm sorry <laughs> for everyone else who may be cut <laughs> off there. Um, but thanks to all the presenters for very thoughtful remarks. I'm wondering, just to be a little bit provocative, if successful scaling up isn't perhaps less about the institutions and the incentives and the succession and so forth than it is about rooting change in local communities, change and capabilities in local communities and populations, which they, though village-based, have permeable boundaries and have the potential for expanding these things. Successful scaling up has 
got to be, in a way, a viral kind of change, if you will, where the pull is much more powerful than the kind of the institutional push that we put against it. Um, I, if we keep focused on the impacts, the changes that we're trying to see, rather than the programs, the projects, the institutional uh, aspects of it, then we can stay focused on the broad-based self-generating and replicating kind of change that has to happen, and private sector has got to be involved, but I would argue communities, community organizations, and civil society, an organic basis for this kind of change has got to be essential. We can't do it as conventional development institutions, and, and perhaps I'm overly skeptical, but I wouldn't look to most governments with a long history of disappointing development impacts to lead us forward on this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask our three speakers, please don't respond to everything. Please. <laughs> no. yeah. Please just take one minute to respond to the, what you think is the most important, and then we formally close, and if you have time, you continue to interact informally. Mirza? No? Governments are vital. As a former governance advisor from DFID, I tell you, we've got to, we really need strong governments. Absolutely. And I think the framework that DFID has or other, peop other agencies have about capacity, accountability and responsiveness we need more governments like that and I, I do take your point that governments um, can do the job and we have to work with them and we have to build capacity uh, but it's going to be a long haul Kevin I've t Rajul you ask us to be um, short so nicely I have to to <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've tried to I think it's what we've heard here is that both governments and local society are the fundamental actors in scaling up and believe it or not I agree with you entirely the question for us in this panel though was what in a sense can outsiders do to stimulate that and I agree particularly with your point that scaling up has to be rooted in local communities if you look at the pace the Peru case study that was it wasn't my staff member I mean, that was the ingredient of our sticking with it. It was rooting these changes in local society. But here's the problem and the dilemma. When we started this in EFAD, the staff would say the same thing. Look, we in EFAD, we come with an innovation, and if it works, it's the government's responsibility and local communities to scale it up. It doesn't work. So the, the question to ask is, what can we do to increase the probability of that process occurring? That's, that's the question. But that should not take away the, f the fundamental points that several of you are making, and that is that if it works, it's because local communities <laughs> have taken something up and it's become rooted, and that governments are supportive rather than killing it. That's the, the essence. So I don't think we, we disagree. It's just this, this mindset that we, we develop the meat and we throw it over the wall, and if it really works, the dogs will eat it. Uh, that, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Uh, and it's not just on the defining scaling up, it's not just bigger projects. Some staff still in EFAD think that it means, they come to me and they say, but we are scaling up. Look, you know, we had a $10 million project, now it's 60 million. <laughs> We've gotten the World Bank to invest in it. We've gotten different. What, it's the scaling up the impact, the number of beneficiaries. And why is this important? We still have, look at the FAO statistics. It's preposterous. Each year we either have 940 million people who are poor and hungry or a billion and it varies between those two numbers every year it d despite all of our successes somebody said uh, that number doesn't diminish does it <laughs> now it diminishes in some countries and increases in others but that's that's the problem so it has to be scaling up impact now what we've done in ifad and uh, before rajul throws me out here is that we've tried to quantify this we have said to our replenishers that we're going to double our efficiency in pulling people out of poverty per dollar loaned or granted. We're going to, in the next three years, increase by two times the number of people pulled out. Now, I don't know if it's going to be four times or not, but that starts to focus the mind because then you can start to ask the staff the following question. One, how many people are going to be pulled out by this program? And where's the doubling effect? And how credible is it? And then they, you know, it's, it's a surrogate, if, if you like. Then they start to ask, well, wh what is it that we're going to be doing or stimulating governments and local communities to do 
to actually have uh, an impact with the same amount of money on twice as many people. It's the, the beginning of an effort to think about, think systematically about scaling up. Maybe I should stop there because Rajul, I can feel her looking <laughs> at me. So. Thank you, Kevin. Johannes? Uh, yeah, I think the private sector engagement is absolutely critical and a number of you, including Mirza, pointed that out. Let me do a little advertisement here at Brookings. We have a project funded by JICA where we're actually looking at this issue, but also advertisement for IFAD because IFAD just organized actually a very interesting event in Rome where it is trying to figure out how to work with private sector. Now here's the conundrum though. I've been party to discussions between IFAD and its uh, membership board and so on. Is they say, look, wait a minute, we're giving public money uh, taxpayer money and you're going to give it to the private sector? What guarantee do I have as a taxpayer's representative that this money isn't just, you know, s give, giving uh, 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 profits to some private investor who is skimming off the top? So in doing that, in, in sort of thinking through how to manage public-private partnerships, which are absolutely key because you need the government, you need the private sector, you just have to get it right. You have to be extremely transparent. You have to be there has to be a competitive element and a whole bunch of other things you've ha got to put into, the, into play. So it's not easy, but it is, I agree, it's essential. And that's, in a sense, looking ahead where the action is. Uh, on just one more question uh, on this buzz, you know, is it a buzzword? You're absolutely right. And this was actually, I remember early on when Kevin and I talked, we both agreed that we have to be sure that this isn't becoming just a buzzword because that risk is always there, especially if the president and the vice president say, scaling up is it, everybody will bring you scaling up proposals, and you look behind it, and very often it's just a word. So um, then the question is, as you and others asked, so what do we mean by scaling up? Of course, then you, and, and so we, we actually went into this, and if you look at this uh, study on IFAD that we circulated, you may find some guidance. Now, one thing I came away in our subsequent work, and actually also work the World Bank has been doing in, in the agricultural development area and scaling up, that it is very business line specific and country context specific. So if you, have a, if you have a rural credit scheme, you might be able to actually you know, cover the whole country. But if you have an area development program for ethnic minorities, well, the scale is obviously totally different. Uh, if you have a, values, uh, a value chain investment, you're, you're sort of thinking about the scale and your EFAT, where you, actually you have to demonstrate that your investment value chain helps the, the poorest of the poor. Then your sort of your 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 definition of scale is a totally different one from the World Bank, where it's basically maximizing growth in a particular value chain. You you look at this differently. So, the key to me is when you begin a project or you begin to invest in what I would call a business line for a particular agency, you need to think through this question: What is the scale? What do I that I uh, might ideally achieve, and how do I get there? And that's the question, unfortunately we so often don't ask. Let me stop here. I so much wish we could scale up this event. Um, I will not attempt any closing remarks or summary. I will simply say I really appreciate that we had this discourse. I think it has generated a lot more interest and a lot more discourse, and I hope that we continue that. I hope we will continue to follow and learn from the IFAD, from the AKDN experiences, also from the various community experiences and so forth. And uh, my wish is that this conversation continues in different forums and different organizations, and I hope we have contributed to that. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>